Africa. The Dark Continent isn't just the realm of jumbo-sized animals. In the bushlands of Namibia, there are also the bat-eared foxes, clever little predators that have to hold their ground against larger rivals. The likeable midget's daily routine is full of adventure and danger. About their family life, little is known. But just now, a German vet is trying to find out what the future may hold for the little robbers. Namib, in southwestern Africa, is one of the oldest deserts on Earth. Its fine sand covers thousands of square kilometers. Though the region seems inhospitable at first, there are lots of animal species that cope well with the heat and the lack of water. The bat-eared fox is one of them. But the undisputed master in dealing with extreme heat is the oryx. By means of a sophisticated thermoregulation system, it can endure a body temperature of more than 45 degrees centigrade without sweating or losing fluid. For German-born vet, Margit de Troyes, that sort of adaptability is only a dream. In the morning, when it's a bit cooler, she heads out to look for the objects of her study, the bat-eared foxes. Usually, however, the little robbers are shy and tend to avoid humans. Margit lives on a farm in Namibia's bushland. Here, she has a fateful encounter when native Namibians bring her an injured bat-eared fox. Hello, Fanta. Come, Long, intensive treatment is necessary to heal the injured leg. But Fanta, as Margit calls the female fox, shows her gratitude by displaying a unique trust towards her savior. It's early morning on the edge of the Namib. Bat-eared foxes take advantage of these cool early hours after sunrise to hunt. Their prey, primarily termites and other insects, is detected crawling underground by the bat-eared fox's highly sensitive ears. They often dig down 30 centimeters until they find what they're looking for. In this case, ants and their eggs. A meal which not only contains important nutrition, but also a great deal of fluid. That is why bat-eared foxes don't have to depend on water holes.
For the larger animals at the edge of the desert, it's a different story. Whether they be elephants, kudus, or blue wildebeest, eland antelopes, or zebras, they all have to drink regularly in order to survive in the blazing heat. Springboks, too, go a long way to find water. Drinking is always a question of who's the strongest. Amidst all the hooves and horns, the black-backed jackal is unable to quench his thirst in peace. Open water holes are extremely rare along the Namib Desert's borderland. Often, there is only one spring within a radius of several kilometers. So there's always a big crowd of animals preparing to face the heat of yet another day of the African summer. The hustle and bustle all too often leads to a free-for-all, and then the oryx's sabre-like horns can become dangerous weapons. Moving among this tumultuous crowd literally means going in harm's way, especially for tiny visitors like these ostrich chicks. Nevertheless, the battler has also brought along its offspring. The youngster's feathers are still brown and plain. The bustard prefers to look on until things calm down a bit. A stone's throw beyond the waterhole, the arid zone begins. Margit's farm is located in a very similar landscape. She has put up a shady tent for herself and her young daughter Isabel on a remote part of her land. This is where she intends not to search for, but to visit bat-eared foxes. Fanta, the injured female that Margit was able to set free after a long period of treatment, has settled down in this area. And she has retained her trust in her adoptive mother. It was a sensational moment for Margit when she discovered that Fanta had become a mother. She has found a mate on the 6,000 hectares of the Nanania farm and given birth to four little ones in a den. Three weeks later, they venture outside for the first time. Fanta's trust in human beings, which developed while being treated, is passed on to her offspring within a short time. Yet they are alert and carefully observe everything that goes on. Little Isabel doesn't necessarily want to share the cookies, those tasty tidbits Fanta was given during her treatment with the bat-eared foxes. It is a unique opportunity to observe and record the social life of a bat-eared fox family without bothering them through close proximity. In this way, Margit gathers a large amount of data, which she later will publish. Data about their feeding habits, how they raise their offspring, how they deal with daily life. In short, 
an important contribution to basic research, which wouldn't have been possible without Fanta's backstory. Still, Margit never catches a glimpse of the father. Although she is constantly on the lookout, he remains concealed. So Fanta does the tidying up all by herself. With the young ones constantly running in and out, they fill the passageways with sand that has to be cleaned out every day. When danger threatens, the escape route into the den must remain passable at all times. A blocked passageway can have nasty consequences. Mother has to tidy up. Time to play. While romping around, the new generation playfully hone the skills that may save their lives one day in Africa's dangerous savannah. Quick reactions and keen senses. Aside from that, the little ones just seem to be having lots of fun wrestling with each other. Sometimes, even Fanta gets caught up in the action and jumps around wildly with her little ones. All that chasing around gives the youngsters quite an appetite. At this age, about six weeks, they still feed exclusively on their mother's milk. Bat-eared foxes are often hunted for their fur, especially in the vicinity of towns. In protected areas, however, they are quite prevalent. Yet their population density has never actually been investigated. Nine a.m. It's still pleasant enough to take a nap in the shade of sparse vegetation. In a few hours, it will be much too hot. In the past, a deep sleep outside the den could have ended fatally. Nowadays, it's less dangerous, since on the farms in the south, most of the large predators, especially the lions, were wiped out generations ago. But the big cats still roam the north, particularly the Atosha region. This lioness has intruded into alien territory and the local pride isn't willing to accept this violation. The lion's commotion alarms the spring box.
But the rivals aren't interested in a real fight which could cause injuries. It is sufficient simply to chase the intruder away. The boss wasn't interested anyway. Though he certainly would have accepted a new female in his pride. You can hardly overlook lions. But leopards? Leopards are even capable of surviving in municipal parks in large cities, being not only very clever, but also extremely secretive. And a few still sneak around the land of the farmers, too. But in the meantime, the breeders, who primarily have sheep here, have set their sights on two other predators. One is the caracal, or desert lynx. Despite merciless persecution, traps and poisoned baits, this sly cat is able to stay alive and raise its young in remote hideaways. Desert lynxes are real daredevils and will even attack sheep, although the sheep are much bigger. That's why every farmer looks upon these cats as his sworn enemies. The jackal's reputation is equally bad, since he is keen on mutton too. On the other hand, a jackal will eat almost anything. When he's desperate, he'll even have a go at horse dung. And leftovers of that nature are, in fact, easy to come by here. There are actually horses living on the edge of the Namib desert. They are probably the wild descendants of animals brought to Namibia by the German army prior to World War I, who escaped into the desert. Most of the horses died of thirst and exposure, but some of the hardiest survived and continue to produce offspring. After several generations living in freedom, the animals have developed tremendous endurance and robustness. The stallions will clash in bitter battles for the favor of the mares. The desert takes a heavy toll on its inhabitants, an ideal spot for vultures. The little ones hightail it when they sense the big bird approaching. But Fanta has had ample experience to be able to tell the difference between dangerous eagles 
and harmless vultures that gather along the horizon before they begin their long surveillance flights across the desert. The apparent danger was just a short intermezzo, so Fanta lets out a soft squeak to give the all clear. In Namibia, in southwestern Africa, bat-eared foxes are usually born in October or November. After a pregnancy of about two months, Fanta gave birth to her offspring. When the young ones are six weeks old, Fanta takes them along on longer expeditions. They are now nimble enough to vanish at a snap should any danger arise. They still don't have to search for their own food. Bat-eared fox mothers are very caring. Fanta will nurse her young ones for at least three months. As soon as they join their mother on her outings, the young ones begin to learn a great deal about the environment and their future prey. An old millipede, for instance, can secrete a putrid fluid. So it's not a particularly inviting meal, and that's good to know. The family's outings become more and more wide-ranging, and the den loses its importance as the centre of activities. So, Margaret decides to give Fanta a collar transmitter, enabling her to find her objects of study on the extensive farm. But how will Fanta react to such an intrusion? At first, Margit's assistant diverts Fanta's attention. Then the critical moment. The collar is put on and screwed tight. An operation which normally requires tranquilizers is a cinch for Fanta. No drugs are needed. Her trust in Margit lets her withstand even this kind of stress. She patiently accepts the entire treatment and doesn't even dash far away when it's over. In January, Summer in the southern hemisphere has reached its zenith. It's hot on the Narnia farm. Everything that was green has dried up. Despite the heat and the lack of moisture, the devil's claw tuber is able to unfold its blossoms. The name comes from the woody fruits which are equipped with long arms and barbs, which often get stuck in the fur of animals, who then unwittingly help to distribute the seeds. Mountain clouds herald the first rainfall. For the bat-eared foxes, the time of abundance is drawing near. One afternoon, the sky darkens. The stormy wind lashes against the trees, and heavy rain pelts down. An hour later, the storm clouds have moved on, but just for today. Tomorrow, 
There will be a new storm brewing, if this is to be a good rainy season. It takes weeks of rain for the ground to soak up enough water for the rivers to fill, a phenomenon which doesn't occur every year in Namibia. Butterflies gather in hundreds for nourishment on the wet riverbanks. Termites begin their short maiden flight to found a new colony somewhere in the savannah. For a predatory centipede, it means a sudden food surplus. It paralyzes its prey with poison before quickly gulping it down. The unexpected abundance of food also lures a scorpion out of hiding. Like the centipede, it is actually a creature of the night, but being flexible pays off. Although the scorpion could easily kill a termite with its pincers, it strikes with its poisonous sting. But the tables can be turned quickly. Termites are a tasty delight for bat-eared foxes too, but Fanta and her family aren't about to skip the chance of catching a fat scorpion. Yet they'd better watch out. Some types of scorpion are so poisonous that their sting can even kill a man. In the end, the scorpion isn't able to cope with all those rapid attacks. Once its stinger has been injured, even the young ones can end the fight. Not every crawling animal encountered by the bat-eared foxes is welcome prey. This heavily armored catadid is well protected. Its many spikes make it an unpleasant morsel. Whereas its delicate relative doesn't stand a chance. With a defense system like this, you needn't fear a bat-eared fox. Fanta has learned by experience that it's no good tangling with a South African hedgehog. But the youngster's curiosity gets the better of them. The spiky discovery is jealously watched. Yet it's a fortress they'll never conquer, and it's just a matter of time before they lose interest. A careless step 
rolls the hedgehog on its back. It's not so easy trying to get back on your feet in loose sand. Thanks to the rain, the desert is in bloom. Every day, the hot African sun draws moisture from the ground so the plants have little time to blossom. Their seeds must often survive during long periods of drought. Now, after the rain, the colony of sociable weavers begins its new breeding season. During the past dry period, the birds rather neglected their homes. The owners have to make sure everything is in shape for the next generation. Year after year, the sociable weavers work on their living complex, creating structures weighing several hundred kilos. Occasionally, older trees actually crack under the weight of their continuously growing burden. These wasps take advantage of the fortresses and are attaching their paper-like nests to the shady side of the birds' grassy homes. Should a ray of sun threaten the brood in spite of this, even for a short moment, the wasps will promptly activate their cooling system. The sociable weavers have other guests too, rosy-faced lovebirds, a small type of parrot. The male enchants the female with a small gift, pre-digested food. Parrots are by no means welcome visitors. They are impertinent squatters. The moment the sociable weavers fly off to look for nest building material, a few rosy faced lovebirds come to inspect the unguarded homes. The sociable weavers have no way to rid themselves of the troublesome squatters. They are forced to raise their young with these nasty neighbours on their backs. Yet neither of the two bird species has trouble finding food. The rainy season was good and the grassland was able to regenerate. Margit 
didn't catch a glimpse of the bat-eared foxes during the heavy rainfall. Now she'd like to know how her protégés are doing. The collar transmitter is an important device in the wide open space of the monotonous landscape. She could hardly discover Fanta and her family with the naked eye. There is only sketchy information about the life of a bat-eared fox. Until now, the little fellow has always stood in the shadow of Africa's large, imposing wild animals. Perhaps this story will change that picture. Somewhere out there is Fanta, constantly transmitting signals, thanks to durable batteries. And Margit is able to locate her with an antenna and a receiver. The bearings illustrate the dimensions of the hunting grounds, the preferred areas, and the animal's daily routine. One result, the family keeps moving further and further away from their den. When they see each other again, Fanta naturally expects some tasty morsels as she received during her treatment. But cookie time is over. Instead, Margit has brought along some bugs which she collected with the help of a flashlight the night before. It's very exhilarating for Margit not only to be accepted by Fanta as part of the family, but also by Fanta's offspring without any suspicions or reservations. The youngsters are now four months old. They are already able to search for food on their own, but they still don't go off alone. And one of Margaret's main tasks is to find out how long the contact with the mother continues. What will the near future bring? A scary question for the growing members of the new generation. Until now, Everything has gone perfectly. The entire litter has survived the difficult first few weeks and months. Neither an eagle nor a four-legged predator has killed one of the young ones, nor have the farmer's traps taken their toll. But will they be able to make it on their own without Fanta's loving care? For the monitor lizards, just like with the bat-eared foxes, there is enough room on the farm. However, they have to adapt to the presence of sheep, dogs and human beings. Bat-eared foxes feed primarily on insects and represent no danger to sheep. But jackals and desert lynxes are attracted to flocks of sheep, almost as if by magic. With a flock this size, it isn't immediately obvious if it's complete. That's why the shepherd puts his animals in a corral at night, so they'll be safe and sound. But the African sheepdogs do sterling work. Every supposed enemy is cornered. Too bad for the monitor, who couldn't care less about the sheep. But sharp claws, and a length of over one meter are no match for a determined pack of dogs.
The monitor will just have to sit this one out. But one of the guardians won't quit that easily. It's only thanks to the needle-like thorns of the acacia that the monitor gets away with just a battered tail. In the end, the dogs lose their zeal. The farm is home to lots of reptiles, including snakes. The young bat-eared foxes are still lacking the proper experience. They don't know whether their opponent is equipped with poisonous fangs. As swiftly as the snake strikes out, the little one jumps aside. Keep a distance. The youngsters have learned their lesson for the day. Now Fanta herself checks if there are any options in this matter. Bat-eared foxes do eat reptiles on occasion, but this fellow is too big and too aggressive. The fact that this mole snake isn't poisonous had no influence on the outcome. When a leopard shows up, a bat-eared fox is in more dire straits. The little predator would be a goner if the bigger one got near enough. But there aren't many of the big cats around anymore, and the swift, bat-eared foxes are not easy to catch. Twelve months have passed. Thanks to additional collar transmitters, Margit has neither lost contact with Fanta nor with her grown-up offspring. Just two kilometers away from the old den, Fanta's daughter Joy has dug her own cradle and had her first litter at the age of one. Margit is surprised by the trust shown to her by even the second generation of bat-eared foxes. Joy even allows Margit to film her cubs just days after they were born. An extraordinary sign of trust. An unusual event is about to take place on the farm. Two bat-eared foxes that Margit has been taking care of are to be released. Four other animals are still waiting for the big day. They too got caught in farmer's traps and have to fully recover first. It takes a long time to overcome the patient's initial suspicions and carry out the necessary treatment. Essentially, it's a full-time job for a vet who shouldn't forget her own offspring. Using her proven cookie method, Margit lures the two animals into the transportation cage and, trustingly, they permit themselves to be carried away.
The area Margit chooses to set them free is near the sociable weaver's tree, close to Fanta's first den. The two foxes aren't quite aware yet that the gate to freedom is opening for them. Not only the bat-eared foxes have developed well, little Isabel has too. The cage days are over. But so are the carefree feedings by motherly Margit. Now they have to stand on their own again. Africa's incomparable magic still exists today, but it can only be experienced in a few places. National parks and other large reserves play an enormously important role in maintaining the natural wilderness and wildlife. In particular, the variety of large species attracts affluent tourists on whose foreign currency many African countries depend. That way, popular animals like elephants are now protected. Many of the smaller, less spectacular creatures, like bat-eared foxes, are far from center stage. But they deserve our attention, and Margit is doing her best to ensure they get it. It is more effective not to wait until the last minute to protect a species. That's why the vet is trying to prepare the ground for protective measures now, in case they become necessary one day. Of course, Margit has become attached to the cute little bat-eared foxes. She hopes that Fanta, Joy and the others will help gain the support of a wider public. That would be an important development to secure their future. The future of the agile hustlers, survivalists of the desert. <laughs>